He has hooked you guys up with some really cool people. Who is your favorite so far? I won't tell them. Don't worry. I won't tell the others. Who is your favorite so far? I would love to hear. Clint. Oh, I love Clint. Oh my gosh, that's awesome. He's a good guy. Who is another one? Mark. Oh, yeah, there you go. Good, good, good. What's another one? Because I think I know just about everybody who's come and sp spoken here before. Is there anybody else? Marie. Marie. Okay, there you go. So I heard another one. Ryan. Ryan. Oh, that's right, that's right. Ryan. That's awesome. Well, guys, I'm Bubba. Um, I was a fat baby, and that's how I got my name. So feel free to call me Bubba. Uh, my real name is Brant, but no one ever calls me Brant. So literally, it's just Bubba. We're tight like that. We're just we're close now. Um, and and I am super lucky to to give you the the ultimate priority, which is right here behind me. I was lucky enough to be able to marry a. Uh, marry a wife who's way, way better than I am. So I married up. I'm the lesser half of our couple. And uh, we've got five little kids. So five kids under the age of seven. It is insane at our house all the time. Just total chaos, like never, never ending. Um, and, and so hopefully today, my goal is to just share with you a little bit of my story and maybe some principles that I've learned along the way. I mean, I wasn't, it wasn't that long ago that I was in college myself. So uh, hopefully you guys can relate and maybe I've got a couple more kids than you or not, but whatever, right? Um, and, and love questions. Um, I don't need to just be the one talking all the time, uh, but hopefully there's some things that you can take away and, and, uh, and finish off this semester on a bang, right? Um, okay guys, so I grew up in San Francisco, uh, in the East Bay of San Francisco. Uh, that's where I call home. My sister's still out there. And then my family has since moved to Arizona. So I've got ties in Northern California and in Arizona near Mesa and, and uh, Phoenix area. Um, and then my wife is from Portland. So we kind of have these, these three areas which we call home. And, uh, and we've now, I've been in Utah since 2001. And man, I love it here. Like we absolutely love it here. When we got married, we never thought we would we would stay. We always thought we'd go off and be close to family. Um, but we are in Draper, Utah now, and it's like some major suburbia, and it's so fun. We love it. Raising our kids here is like the best thing ever. So we are here to stay. And uh, we just moved into a home about seven months ago, and we hope that will be our last. We never want to move again. That is a nightmare of an experience um, as you accumulate all kinds of crap. But um, so a little background. So family here, and then I'm a religious guy. So I've always followed this kind of mantra. Every time I'm obedient, I get blessings and it helps me to have an even better family. So I know this is, we're not doing a religious class, so that's all I'm gonna say. But uh, this was, has been a huge element for me, even with my parents and now with my wife and with kids. It all helped because I went to Brazil for a couple years and uh, that was a blast to get to know Brazilians out there speak Portuguese. I wish I could say I was as good as I was way back then. Um, but this, these were like life altering things that helped me as I move forward. A lot of what I did on this mission helped me as an entrepreneur as well. So that just kind of gives you some background. Okay. And so here's some of the things that I, I feel like are imperative as an entrepreneur. How many by raise of hands want to start a company someday? Awesome. That's why you're in the class, right? How many of you already have started a company or some sort of started something? Awesome, that's cool, that's rad. Um, and uh, and uh, the reason why I asked, I just wanna to get to know kind of the audience. How many of you, maybe I can't legally ask this, how many of you are married? Whoa, way more than I expected. That's awesome. Is this like, a, is this one of the, I'm so sorry, I wish I knew better. Is this like at the end of your major class? So you guys have been around for a while. You guys are almost done. Okay, that, make, that makes more sense. I wasn't sure. Um, okay, so that's cool. So the family thing works. So uh, some of the things that I felt like for, as an entrepreneur that are going to help you guys survive and thrive is just making sure that you've worked on those communication skills. Um, if you're trying to pitch an investor, for example, maybe you want to use investors, maybe you don't. We'll talk about that in a bit. Um, if you cannot present that idea well, um, they're not going to help you. Same thing with customers. If customers, and you're taking your business or your product to a customer and they can't understand what you're talking about, 
or they can't be persuaded that your thing is better than the other thing, you're gonna have a hard time. And so that communication is so incredibly important. If you can, practice it every day. And a lot of times, if I was testing an idea, I would make 100 cold calls. I know that sounds horrible to do, but it was an easy way to test out that idea and practice what I, how and what I said to see if it would resonate with that customer. And so anyway, communication is huge. Uh, with work ethic, that's a no-brainer. You guys know, as startup folks, you have to work harder than everyone else because there's somebody else trying to build your same business somewhere else in the world and you have to out-hustle them. That's all, that's all there is to it, right? If you can out-hustle them, sure, they might even have more funding than, than you. But if you can out-hustle them, you might have a better product. You might get a better team. You, you know, there's a lot of ways that you, can, that you can gain an advantage. And then reputation is something that you build your entire lives. So right now you're in this class, you've been at, at UVU for a little while now, you're probably gonna be graduating soon. Um, you've already built part of your reputation. So when you go out to either get a job or, or pitch investors or sell customers, they may have already heard of you from somewhere, someone. Uh, you guys have seen, how many of you have LinkedIn profiles? Okay, I didn't see everyone's hand. Please sign up and get a LinkedIn profile. I am in no way affiliated with them, but that is such a huge, huge importance. And ask people to give you recommendations on LinkedIn. So if you have a profile or if you don't, get one and then ask for recommendations because that will help you to build your reputation. For those that are looking from the outside in, the very first thing I did if I was hiring an employee, I didn't look at the resume, I went to their LinkedIn profile. I Googled them, why not? If you got arrested, it was gonna show up, right? If I looked at your Facebook pictures and you were like, Mr. Party Animal, I might think twice. So, I mean, think about it, right? Everything's out there in the public. Your reputation is going to matter a huge amount whether it's getting a job or starting a company or finding a partner or a co-founder. And if for those, there aren't very many, but for those single peeps, your reputation is gonna matter for that too. Um, okay, so this is my very first company started while I was going to BYU. It's called Seat Ability, which is probably the worst name in the world, but we did chairs. So it was kind of funny, Seat Ability. Maybe I just thought it was funny. But uh, so this is one of the, you guys have heard of NOAA's, the event centers um, that they have around here. They were one of our first customers and we were so stoked that they bought our chairs. These were bungee chairs, like I'm not, just bungees that we put on a frame and we sold these chairs. It was ridiculous. But we uh, imported most of these chairs from China or Taiwan and then we had distribution uh, centers in uh, San Diego, so Southern California and North Carolina. So we had both uh, ends of the country covered. And then I was single at the time and I was traveling around the country like crazy, going to every trade show I possibly could to learn and sell. I was just gonna sell the heck out of these chairs and make it a successful company. I had five other partners and that was mistake number one. That is way too many partners to have in a company. Two and three are like ideal, but no more than that. You can, if you're getting together with your best buddies and they're like, let's do a company, that might not end like you want it to. Um, so one of, some of the things I learned here was that we, we had just too many chefs in the kitchen. We all thought we were the boss. And after about two years, a couple of us ended up selling out to our partners which I did and one other guy, and that was the best thing I could have done. It allowed the other four to go and move on with the business and, and do their thing, and I got cash out of it, which, hey, as a poor college student, that was pretty awesome to get some money. Um, helped me pay off some school debt, paid for my wife's ring, because we were about to get, get engaged, and uh, we even put a down payment on a little townhome up in Salt Lake, which we still own as a rental. Isn't that cool? So one thing uh, uh, with this piece here, uh, is that we were able to focus on a certain style of business. Um, have you guys heard of kind of the growth versus lifestyle? Has anybody talked about that here before? Because I don't have to belabor it if you guys have already heard it a little bit. Okay, so why I think this is an important piece to talk about with entrepreneurs is uh, depending on what you're building as a business, you are determining whether you're going the route of a growth style business or a lifestyle business. Both are equally as awesome. 
There is not a worse way to go. They have pros and cons. And here's the main difference. Growth style businesses typically have investors that back them. So it's an investable business. It's something that investors can get back behind and they want to give you a million dollars because they want 10 million back. There's this 10x rule with investors. They essentially don't invest in you unless they think they can get a 10x return. That's kind of their, their judgment call. Okay. So growth business is that means you have a big enough market and you have people that can fund you to be able to go sky's the limit. Everybody talks about unicorns nowadays. That's kind of the, the concept of a growth business. If you cannot become a unicorn, which is a, a billion dollar valuation company, then you, that's not technically considered a growth style business. At least that's what investors would tell you. So that's that side of the business. I've done one of those, right? I have not taken it to be a unicorn. I, I'll tell you that story in a minute. Um, and then there's a lifestyle business and the lifestyle is just what it talks about. It's a business that produces a phenomenal income for you and your family so that you can have a killer lifestyle. You can go boating every other day if you wanted, or you can take half days and go skiing because you've got your employees running the show, or you have enough cash in the bank that you can invest in other things and diversify. So there's a lifestyle side which makes a good income. It is typically not backed by investors. And there is normally a much less, if you ever were to sell it, um, a much lower multiple. That term multiple is usually based on either profit of the business, EBITDA or, or revenue, depending on what kind of business. If you're a tech company and you're venture backed, you might get a seven, eight, nine, ten 10 X multiple on your revenue. So if you built a $10 million company, you might sell it for a hundred million dollars, which is insane. If you're a lifestyle business, and I'm just giving you general terms here, lifestyle businesses, and you'd have a $10 million lifestyle business, you might sell it for 12 or $15 million. Does that make sense? So th there are differences there. Usually lifestyle businesses are built to hold on to and just cash cow that sucker. Just produce as much cash as you can and run as many of your life's expenses through it as you can and help you pay the government what you owe them, but not a penny more. That's usually lifestyle businesses are fantastic for that. Growth style businesses are going to, uh, in my experience, you're going to be traveling a lot. You're going to be doing a lot of investor meetings. You're going to be working your tail off to build that company and hopefully it succeeds. The reason why investors want a 10x return is because they know that nine out of 10 of their investments will fail. How crazy is that? So that's why they need to make sure that one of those things gets their money back or hopefully more than that. You guys cool with that concept? So growth and lifestyle, that makes sense? So when you guys are building your companies or you're starting, think about it. Is this to produce a great lifestyle for you and your family? Or is this to go shoot for the moon and you're probably going to strike out because that's just the odds, 9 out of 10. Um, or, you know, you'll hit that moon. Or maybe you land on stars or whatever, you know? So just know that. It'll really help you to determine um, if you're... If you want to be on the cover of Inc. Magazine, it's most likely going to be a growth style business. Most likely. But, uh, but if you want to just run your thing and make some fat cash, lifestyle is awesome. Okay, I, I won't belabor that. Um, I noticed uh, my family picture in the very, very beginning had a watermark because I pulled it from my wife's blog. I was trying to find our family, our most recent up-to-date picture. I pulled it from my wife's website, funcheaperfree.com. So my wife, as I told you, is way cooler than I am. She totally is. She is way more famous than I will ever imagine to become. She's been on Good Morning America, The Today Show, HGTV, TLC. I mean, this girl has done just about anything. She's currently talking to, to production uh, companies to do her own TV show, which is just insane. So she started this blog, Fun, Cheap, or Free, another horrible name, but what the heck. And uh, she started it when I began my first business, which I'll talk to you in just a bit. And my first business, I did not take a paycheck for the first year. Literally 12 months, I did not get a dime out of the business. I was just figuring it out and hiring the right people and trying to figure out what I was doing, if it was right and working. And I made a promise to her when I started. I said, hey babe, I want to start a company. I want to be an entrepreneur. This is the thing I want to do. Will you support me in that effort? 
And she said, well, what does that mean? And I was like, well, that means I need you to make enough for us to live off of. And she's like, so we're going to go from a dual income down to a single income and it's mine, which is less? I was like, yeah. You okay with that? And she was like, okay, you know, hey, I love you. I want to support you as, as your wife. So here's the line in the sand. If you can support our family by the time we have our first kid, we're good. If you can't, you quit and you get a job. I was like, oh, dang. Okay, I can do that. I'll do that. We had a baby 12 months later. <laughs> so that lit a little fire under the tush. And, uh, and that helped me, right? That helped me to get things going and it had an end date. I was not going to drag my family through the mud um, forever and ever trying to figure this thing out. I had to figure it out or I had to give it up. I thought that was a great thing to do, um, at least for us. We drew a line in the sand and that was the thing. Uh, I took my first paycheck the same month my son came home from the hospital, which is pretty cool. Um, but anyway, so she writes all things frugal living and you can tell why. Dual income to single, we had nothing. We were not going out to movies. We sold one car, I walked to work or rode my bike or longboarded, whatever, and uh, to my, my, my makeshift office that we like hustled together. And she just started writing about how we did, how we lived, how we did it, how we were you know, making it work. And now she's got uh, just about a half a million people a month that come to her blog and read and she has all kinds of followers all over the place and anyway, it's fun. Love her to death. And she's smoking hot. That, that, that was just a perk. She's awesome. Okay, so um, the things that we had to learn through that process, I'm going to skip the slide, but it, it's very simple. We just had to figure it out. There's ways that you can do it. Your students, you guys are doing it right now. You're figuring it out. You're hustling. You're scrappy. If there's ever free food, you take it. Um, y y those kind of things, right? So this is the first company, launchleads.com. Started in 2009. I was 25. And I started in January of 2009. Does anybody remember what happened in 2008? Yeah. So it wasn't exactly the best time to just like dive in and start companies because everyone was freaking out. They were all just like fire was on and they were you know, hunkering down. So starting a company in January 2009 was, was a fairly interesting thing uh, to do. But I felt like if I was going to start it at any time, I had to do it then. Um, you know, we had less responsibilities. We didn't have any kids at the time. We did have one mortgage, but it was small. Um, and, and we could have rented it out any time and gone lived somewhere else. So Launch Leads, all it did was took my current skill sets, my skill sets at the time, and I just built a business around those skill sets. This is a lifestyle business. We do, out, essentially, we are an outsourced sales company. So we help most of these business-to-business -business tech companies that you see on the billboards. We do a lot of their sales for them. And so that's, that's really what LaunchLeads is. It's a super simple idea, like not difficult to think about. They wanted us to call people, and so we called people for them. They wanted appointments to be set so their closers could close deals. We would set those appointments for them. If they wanted us to close deals, then we would close deals for them. I mean, it's a really simple concept because my career had basically been around sales. So I was going to start a company. I wasn't going to start a company in like a medical device because I had zero experience in that world. But I knew sales pretty well. I had built sales teams. I had managed salespeople. I had done sales compensation. That world I kind of knew a little bit because I had experience there. And so that helped me to start this company a lot easier than if I would have started like us, for example, a software company right away. I'm not a developer. I didn't know any developers. I had no experience doing that. In 2009, that wasn't as popular of a thing to do. Although I should have, but anyway. So, so I just started something that was simple to me. Like if you are super passionate about longboarding and that's all you want to do all day and day out, then maybe you think about something around that world, right? If you love building apps, then maybe you focus on that. Or maybe just think about what you love and are passionate about. Because when you build that company, it is going to suck the life out of you. And if you do not love it and are passionate about it, you're not going to survive. So you've just got to be absolutely in love with it. Now, you don't have to be in love with every aspect of the business. 
but you need to be in love and passionate about it or else you just won't survive. It, it's really hard to do. So anyway, launchleads.com. If anybody's moving up to Salt Lake anytime soon, we are always hiring and we love awesome people. So, so this company is still going, by the way. This is my lifestyle business. I uh, built it in 2009, grew it. It has, I don't know, about 35 employees. It's a fairly modest company. And I hired a CEO to run it about two years ago so that I could start my next venture. So that process was really weird. And I doubt we'll have time to go through that whole thing. But I hired somebody to run my baby. Like literally, we had my son, right? And I took that first paycheck. And I had like birthed this company at the same time. My wife had this baby and I had this company. And it was like, we seriously had these babies that we were taking care of. It was, it was incredible. And they walked through their infancy together and toddler and all this stuff. And... Uh, Anyway, so this company hiring somebody else to come and be the guy, to be the person that everyone, the buck stops with him. I still own the company. I gave him a little bit of ownership, but I still own the company and I get to take some awesome cash out of it every single month. That's called a lifestyle. So technically, I earn enough from this company every month that I don't have to work. I, must, I could be retired, you could call that. Well, I don't know if I'll ever retire, but... But that company is a lifestyle cash flow business. It's profitable, although it took three years to get to good profitability. Um, this business is fantastic for us and my family. And I'm able to run tons of expenses through that company and follow all of the tax laws and tax codes and pay maybe less than I would if I didn't have this company. But I, I obviously pay everything that government, I owe the government. Just not a penny extra. And uh, so anyway, Launch Leads, love it, it's fantastic. If you're going the route of lifestyle businesses, more power to you. Cash flow is so fun, because you can do so much with that. Let me tell you about some other experiences. Um, when you are building your company, there's some of the mistakes entrepreneurs make, which is they spend like a year building whatever that thing is. Whatever widget, whatever technology, app, something they build and they build and they build and they're so stoked because they built this amazing widget and then they go to try and sell it and they fall flat on their faces because they've never actually talked to customers about it. They talked to their mom, they talked to their roommates or their girlfriend and they were all like, oh, this is awesome, high five, yeah. And they all turned around and were like, oh, that's a horrible idea, right? But you didn't know that. So if you started a business and you built it first, let me try and help you now, or in your next company, sell it before you even design and build it. Now, this concept is really hard to soak in sometimes. So let's just take it, take it one step. Selling it means you have a new idea and you need to go and talk to people about it. The concept of like holding your idea so that nobody else will steal it is bullcrap. Because really, if somebody else is gonna steal your idea and execute better than you, then you shouldn't have been the guy to do it anyway. Or go, okay? Companies, startups are all about execution. The idea is a tiny, point, tiny part of that. There are a hundred other people with your same idea somewhere else in the world, and they're working on it right now. You might not think that, but I promise you that's the truth. Those ideas come to all kinds of people. Whoever executes better wins. So that, that's something to think about. So sell it first, go talk to customers, talk to people, get what they want from it. You sell them your idea and they're like, oh, that's really cool, but I, I would really be nice if it did this. Now, there's some product development roadmaps and product lean methodologies that are always telling you to be talking to customers and iterate, 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 pivot, pivot. Have you guys read some of those books? Okay, so I'm, I'm saying terms that you guys maybe have heard. Um, and so that's, just follow those rules, right? Go talk to customers, get what they want, and then you can design and build after you know. And here's the best way to prove that this works. The best way to prove that you've done this process is collect real money. Before you build it. Before. I know that sounds insane. It's like selling vaporware, and it is. You are gonna tell that person, you do not have this company yet. 
You're going to tell the customer this is not a built, fleshed out product yet. But you are pre-selling it. Who's heard of Kickstarter? Kickstarter was like the miracle to all entrepreneurs for mostly product-based companies. Uh, it's harder for services type companies. But, but anyway, you get the point. You're pre-selling a product before you even have to build it. I don't think you can get any better than that, right? You're proving that the world wants this coolest cooler that has sound with it. Have you guys seen that? Anyway, um, right? I mean, it's, it, that is an amazing concept. So sell it first and maybe you give them a discount first because they're not going to get it right away, right? So, hey, you're going to be my first 10 customers. You're going to get it for 75% off because you're going to wait six months while I go build this thing. And if people are willing to give you hard cash money, you know you're onto something and not just your family and friends. Strangers. Are you cool with that? Cool with that concept? Sell it and then go design build. It will solve you so many problems and way less of you will fail if you follow this type of process. Okay. Here's the current venture. Um, outro is how you say it. Like intro, but outro. And uh, honestly, what we do is produce introductions. That's it. We're in a referral automation platform. I know that's like fancy words, but we basically took the process of making an introduction and just automated it with software. So this is the company that I went the growth style. So you guys heard my, my lifestyle business, which is still freaking awesome because it produces cash every month. And then you have this growth style business and here's the pros and cons. I raised money because I had a reputation right? Because I had been working my tail off. I had been networking with as many people as I could all the time. I had been really, hopefully, nice to people and I treated customers well with my first lifestyle business. That when I went to talk to my first investor, they said, oh, Bubba, we, we've heard about you. You've actually worked with some of our portfolio companies and they love you guys. So you know, you must know what you're talking about. And I was like, sweet. I didn't even know this guy. This is awesome. I got $400,000 from them in four weeks. That was my first investor conversation. I had never talked to investors before that, really, other than like maybe see them at networking events or something, right? But it was because I had a reputation and they believed that I knew what I was talking about. And hopefully that was true. Um, so reputation, remember we talked about that way early. Hugely, hugely important. I have a friend of mine who is a super entrepreneur. He is a genius. The, he created the very first Bluetooth keyboard. You know the ones that like you can use with your, your iPads and stuff, whatever? He created the very first one and sold it to Zag. If you guys have heard of that company. He sold it to them. And then he, anyway, he's just genius, right? He's created this new product called No Key and it's a Bluetooth padlock. Anyway, he's just a genius guy. But he had some trouble. He went through some legal things and, uh, and which were totally taken care of. Everything was totally, he was on the up and up. There was nothing like, he didn't ever went to jail, nothing like that, right? But just because online somebody said something negative, investors are having a hard time funding him. Just because of that, even though he's a stellar guy, he was my neighbor, he's a super entrepreneur, he should be getting funding from everyone and some people are having reservations just because of that. It's not lame, but that's the way it is. So you just gotta make sure you're, you're treating life the way you need to now. Uh, we've been lucky enough at Outro to be featured in all kinds of fun stuff, but I, I kind of, I can say that I've, hmm, manipulation's not the right word to use. Um, but I've been able to network with writers of other publications because I write for Inc. So I get to write for Inc.com uh, I write maybe about four or five times a month. And as a writer, I get to meet a whole bunch of other writers. And as you do that, some people say, dude, I'd love to write about your company. I'm like, you're from Forbes? Heck yeah. And so we got featured in a whole bunch of different places like Forbes or, or HuffPost or, or Entrepreneur Magazine or TechCrunch, things like that. But it was all based on network, right? Um, outro, long story short with Outro, we raised $1.2 million dollars. Um, we were lucky enough to get accepted into Techstars. And uh, what I will do, I'll talk about accelerators near the end because that's where I have it slated, if that's okay. 
uh, went through Techstars, which is the accelerator that, that Mark was talking about. And uh, we started selling this before we built, designed and built, right? I was selling, selling, selling. I had collected $100,000 from customers before we had a real product. So I'm thinking, I've made it, right? If I've collected that much money from customers before I've even built the product, then we are set. Long story short, it took us almost two years, about a year and a half, to get the product to function properly and to, to figure out some things. Holy moly, that took way longer than I thought. Software companies tend to have this reality. If you think it's gonna take you six months, multiply by, that by three. And it, if you think it's only gonna cost you, you know, $200,000 to build it, multiply that by five. So some of those ways, that'll just help you kind of prepare yourself. Literally, think about it and like budget it out what, what it's gonna cost, triple it, quintuple it, just so that you have the right expectations. You're just gonna run into stuff you never knew existed or problems or situations. Building software companies are hard. That's why people buy them for 10 times their re revenues. They're just really hard to figure out and it's hard to scale. So outro has been a tough go. It has not catapulted into the universe like we had thought it would just yet. And so maybe I'll come back next year and tell you what happened, but uh, um, it has been a difficult go. It has been an incredible opportunity, wonderful learning, but I'm not taking a paycheck and haven't for almost a year from this thing. Luckily I have my other company or else I'd be on the street. Right. So anyway, just, just to paint the picture, I don't mean to be a downer. I don't want to be a downer, but software companies are hard. So just expect hardness when you go through that. Um, we'll skip that and that. Um, so I wanted to show you this slide. This is a slide that I used on my investor pitch deck. So I actually, like this is just pulled straight off my investor deck. And I, the reason why I put this on here is because I wanted investors to know that I was humble enough to, to work with mentors and advisors. Sometimes investors, they know that if they give you their money, you might be arrogant enough to say, thanks for the cash, peace. I know exactly what I need to do from here on out. Most investors want to know that you're humble enough to take their cash and then say, oh crap, we screwed up can you help us? Or, hey, we need some feedback or whatever, right? They want you to be able to, to learn from your, uh, your um, uh, experiences, learn from your failures, and be able to iterate, pivot, and, and get this thing going. Most investors know when they invest in your company today, if it's a seed stage investment, early stage investment, that it won't be the same company a year later or two, two years later. It'll most likely morph and change into things like that. Um, and so, but anyway, so here's some of the guys, maybe you know a couple local ones, uh, a few of them are out of the state. But uh, we were lucky enough. Have you guys done Startup Weekend or heard of Startup Weekend before? Startup Weekend is this thing that Google has put on in the past and it's now owned by Techstars, which is kind of cool. But Startup Weekend is 54 hours where you randomly get selected with some people and you build a company in 54 hours. I mean, as much as you can in 54 hours, but you hustle. And then you compete with other people in that group. So there's like 10 folks and somebody wins. And I went there to be a mentor not to pitch an idea, I just went there to be a mentor. And then they mentioned, they were like, hey, anybody can pitch an idea. And I was like, well, I got an idea. And so I pitched it, we ended up winning the whole thing, and then we get, got accepted to Startup Next, which was a part of Google's program, also now owned by Techstars. And, uh, and we won that one. And they introduced me to investors in New York and in San Francisco. And they were like, wow, this is a cool idea. You should, guys should keep moving forward with this. Then we applied to Techstars, which is the um, accelerator and that essentially takes they give you money as an investor and then they mentor you for four months and then they send you off on your way to take over the world and uh, and so long story short we were lucky enough to go through this process here are two of the four investors that we currently have sorry the deck the slides a little old but um, but these are two local investors so if you guys were thinking about pitching investors um, if you googled Utah list of investors or Utah investor list, my ink article might pop up and I listed like all 30, everybody. So if you wanted to like talk to investors, there's a whole list on that ink article you can find. Okay, here it is. Um, have, any, have any of you guys applied to a, an accelerator before? 
Nobody. How, how many of you actually have heard of one of these two? Okay, so not many. Okay, so this, this will be good. I'll, I'll try and be fairly brief. Accelerators, like we talked about, mentor, invest, that's what their whole thing. They take applications from young entrepreneurs, typically, like us, and you try to pitch them on why your idea is freaking amazing, why it's gonna take over the world. These guys are looking for growth style businesses, not lifestyle businesses, because these guys are looking at it from the investor's perspective. They want a 10x return, okay? So when you apply, and if you go to F, if you're ever considering building a growth style business, I would highly recommend going through an accelerator because all of the things that you currently are struggling with or don't know, they can help you with. And they'll make intros and they'll help you figure out problems and it's an amazing network builder. So use this website, f6s.com. You can apply to like 30 accelerators at one time instead of like filling out a form for each individual one. That's like the secret sauce. And uh, what these guys are going to do is these two are the number one and two in the country. So anyone going to an accelerator, their goal is to get into one of these two. And I'll, I know I went through Techstars. Y Combinator is still ranked number one. But Techstars was phenomenal. And so I highly recommend either one, right? Try and get into them. And more and more Utah companies are getting accepted. We were the very first one from Utah to go through Techstars Boulder program which is their headquarters, Boulder, Colorado. Um, you are going to be sitting in a co-working space essentially, most of the time, working with these folks and other startups around you. You're gonna learn so much from the people around you, from the mentors that they bring, from all the investors that they introduce you to, and then you pitch at the end of this three to four month program, and they help you to pitch in front of hundreds of investors. So there's a, a higher probability that you can gain funding by going through an accelerator. You typically give up a percentage of your business, six or 7% of the business, but I will tell you from personal experience, it is well worth it. Well worth it. <coughs> you guys have heard of dilution? Dilution means that as you continue to raise more and more money or give away more and more shares, everybody gets diluted in their ownership. That six or 7% will get diluted to like 1% in the lifespan of your company. So it's really not that big of a deal. So I, I had a hard time with it at the front because my lifestyle business, I owned 100% of it. And so I was really, really having a hard time giving away anything. And I realized that having a co-founder and sharing you know, equity with that person was really important and bringing on investors for a growth style business was, was very helpful. And it was okay to give up that ownership for their financial help and their knowledge and network. How many of you guys want to build or, or go work with investors? Does anybody want to work with investors? Maybe I've pitched a bad concept on investors today. So not as many as I thought, that's actually okay. Um, there's a guy, I didn't put this up here, but if you want to take note, um, there's an entrepreneur who sold his company to salesforce.com for over $100 million. His name is David Cummings. It's davidcummings.com or .org. Google it, you'll find it. He has some of the best emails that he sends out every day. It's just, they're super short, super, super short. In teaching young entrepreneurs the world of venture-backed companies and how to do it, how to, how to thrive and survive, davidcummings.com. I just love the guy. He's, he's done a great job. He's in Atlanta. He's in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, but, uh, but really, really well-spoken guy and, and explains the concepts that we all need to know uh, early and, and often. Um, okay, so if I, if I remember right, we've talked now about growth, lifestyle, talked about reputation, talked about a couple of the companies that I've started now. There's three. I, I left one out that wasn't as interesting. Um, and... And we've kind of talked about some of these concepts of building your own companies. I think we have 10 to 15 minutes. I'd love to just free for all open-ended questions and let's just go at it. Hit me with all you got. Yeah, if we even need mics or whatever. Um, I don't think I need to explain this stuff. Become an expert, build relationships, and you can never think big enough. 
And then, oh, oh, just real fast before we hit questions, here is my, uh, my Twitter handle. Feel free to follow me on Twitter. Um, add me on LinkedIn. I, don't, I didn't bring any business cards. I knew that it wouldn't, it would be hard to pass them out. So hit me on LinkedIn. Add me. I will promise I'll add you back. Unless you have some crazy looking profile. Um, and, uh, and feel free to reach out. Like I would be happy to help as, as, as much as I can. I might not be as quick to respond via email because I get like 300 emails a day. So hit me on LinkedIn. That's going to be the best way. Let's keep in contact. You never know if the person sitting next to you or the person that's here or there is your next investor, your next employee, your next co-founder, your next whatever, your next customer. You never know. So please make sure that you are always kind and nice to those around you because you never know. Anyway. Yep. So as an entrepreneur early on, life is crazy, nonstop, you're tired, you're stressed. Um, now that you've gotten, I guess, further along in your entrepreneur days, what would you say is your number one go-to free time event or what makes you just relieve of stress and yeah. be happy? So no, family time, right? Because if I get any chance to play with the kiddos, that is like totally number one. I'll go sled like I was just sledding with my kid yesterday. And there's like grass still, because it's been warm, well, fairly warm. There's still grass on our yard, but we were sledding anyway. And, uh, you know, my daughter had a doctor's appointment this morning, so I got to take her. Like spending quality time with kids is by far the number one. If I don't have access to the kids for whatever reason, it's books. I love reading books. I'll be, let me clarify, I love listening to books. <laughs> Audio books are my friend, reading books, that's almost impossible for me to sit down and like read an actual book. But audio, I'm like constantly on Audible. If you guys have ever heard of Audible or like podcast, oh my gosh, I'm just like just eating it alive. I love it. So right now it's quite interesting. I'm listening to, it's more of a religious thing. It's Mike Stroud is his name. And, uh, and so I'm getting into this. He's like going through some crazy cool concepts. The last business book that I read uh, or listened to um, was called uh, Art of St The Art of the Start by Guy Kawasaki. There's some amazing books online. I, I should, you know what? That's actually a good concept. Next time, I will put a slide of my Audible books that I've downloaded. That way you guys can totally like check out all the books that I've been reading. And uh, The Art of the Start, though, for what you guys are doing right now is awesome. Uh, there's another one. If you're think if you are interested in ever doing the venture capital route, venture deals is the Bible for first time venture capital raisers. It's called venture deals. Um, okay, those are some good ones. Oh, oh, this one's awesome. If if start with why by Simon Sinek, start with why super good book, and another one. To Sell is Human by Daniel Pink. Anyway, I could go like over all, all kinds of things. Oh, predictably Irrational is super cool. It will blow your mind. Anyway, great question.